Okay, we're uh, speaking to Mr. Bob Clendenin, a character actor who goes way, way back. He's got over 116, I think, IMDb credits and counting. I've got a few things that maybe are like deep dive questions that you don't typically get asked. And I'm going to try to take it in a different direction and see uh, see what you have to say about some of those things. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm partly terrified and partly uh, exhilarating. So <laughs> that's great. Uh, thank you for thank you for having me. It's a it's a real pleasure to, to meet you guys and to, to be able to talk to you. Likewise. So I'm going to just step back for a second and let you kind of take me from Ohio out west and down under and, and let's talk about that. Uh, I, I wish I had more to say about Ohio because I know it's a, 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 a wonderful, wonderful state and I've spent some time in Columbus and in Cincinnati since then. But um, I was born there because my father, um, shortly after he finished undergrad, was employed by Kaiser Aluminum, um, which was in uh, Newark, Ohio. And so we were there for about uh, two to three years before he would then went on to graduate school in Boston. And I obviously went with the family moved there and then ultimately out West um, uh, before moving to Australia uh, for my father's work. And so I really had the, my most formative years in Australia, in Melbourne um, from the ages of about nine uh, to 18 before I came back to this country to go to, to college myself. Not only were you a math and science guy, you, you went to Cornell, which is, um, you know, it makes me think of the office, number one. <laughs> right. Ed Helms. Because Ed Helms, yeah, exactly. Andy. Yeah. And uh, the other thing is, you know, there's some things that, that um, resonate with me, and I'm going to throw a couple things at you. So I hear, and this may not be true, but I hear that you might be the great-grandson of the Robert H. Treeman. And if I get that wrong... Uh, I apologize. Nope. You, I don't know how you know him, but that is absolutely correct. That's on my mother's side of the family. Um, and he was a Cornelian. In fact, I, uh, I was a fourth, fourth generation Cornelian. So, um, which I sort of kept to myself a little bit because I know that that probably helped me a little bit in the, uh, acceptance, uh, in, <laughs> in my application process, but, um, you know, it's a great school and I had a great time there. I didn't end up being a, a terribly good engineer, even though I love math and science. Um, and I discovered the theater department sort of about halfway through my my time there. And that's where I really started to focus, even though I, I finished with an engineering degree. Uh, but it was a great place to go to school. And I and I I still love um, math and science. In fact, that's one of my my thing, my little, um, <laughs> you know, time wasters is I'll go back and do like little. SAT sections or, um, you know, <laughs> I love see if it. I can see if I can still prove Pythagoras theorem and things like that. So <laughs> test myself. Is that obviously your, your one as well? It sounds like. I think A squared, B squared is C squared. That's about all. I, I'm shooting okay. blanks <laughs> after that, right? So. <laughs> after that? Okay. There's a really cool little way you can prove it with triangles in a big box. Did you get into improv at Cornell or was that after you got to Penn State? My best friend uh, at the time, who's now a big, a big shot executive at um, Paramount named Lee Rosenthal, he and I were roommates for several years. Oh, wow. And um, he and I started this improv troupe, Whistling Shrimp. We were given the name by uh, some upperclassmen that we knew who they had, there was a theater uh, sort of like they had done sort of new plays and things. And they said, well, you can have the name, which comes with, I think, $200 a year in, in student <laughs> funding, right, for the club so we could print flyers. Uh, so if we took the name and we could turn it into anything we wanted and we, and Lee, uh, he was a big fan of improv. And back then they didn't campuses. This was really an unheard of sort of territory. There were very, very few groups doing it. Um, you know, there was like second city and, and a couple places in Canada, but like, it was really un, unknown as a, as a, as a format. And so we started this and we played a lot of Viola Spolin games and Michael Shirtliff games. And we um, auditioned, we got about six, people and uh, formed a little company and we did shows. It was just a blast. And so that carried me through for the last two to three years of Cornell. Um, and then I went to Penn State for, for acting. And unfortunately the improv stuff took a, um, a sideline for those years because, you know, this was quote unquote serious actor training. And so yeah. it was, it was all, you know, it was Shakespeare and Chekhov and all this stuff. Um, and it wasn't until I got out to Los Angeles and it came back because we started, I got involved with a, a bunch of people who were doing these improvised comedies like um, 10 Items or Less or um, Quick Draw, which were both um, largely improvised um, uh, TV shows. And so, it, so those skills that I'd had at Cornell sort of came back and were helpful, you know, 20 years later. 
Um, but I, I love improv. You do it a lot in commercial auditions still. I think it keeps you sharp just in, in general conversation with people. It's a, it's a great, it's a great skill to have. Yeah. Cause I'm thinking like with improv, you know, a couple things, one with you being, um, obviously very bright and having this background in engineering, math, science kind of deal, you're always solving problems in your head, right? And in, um, and trying to draw a parallel to improv, right? It's like, you don't know what's coming. Blank sheet of paper, boom, do something. Well, that's true, but it's also, I think for me, it was always something that was particularly terrifying because as a math and science person, I like correct answers. And if you go into an improv format, you've got to be willing to trust everything you you just you go with the flow and that i think requires a, mu a much more right brain person who is like i can't paint i can't draw because i can't i don't i can't follow but i can do carpentry because that has very very hard rules but that creative aspect is not something that comes very naturally to me so so learning those improv skills at first was really terrifying to me because i didn't know if i was doing it right you know absolutely um do you ever have the fear of going blank and freezing up? Oh, right? I still do. Absolutely. It's like, but, you know, what do you do, right? Well, it's that's one of the reasons I've never done, I've never had the courage to do stand up is because you have nobody to rescue you. Um, mm -hmm. But in, in improv, if you're, if you're good with your group and your scene partners, there's always going to be a little bit of a safety net. If you start to freeze up or go in the wrong direction, hopefully you can kind of be pulled out of it and rescued by the other people who are on stage with you. And, um, and that, and that level of trust is another kind of building block. Um, that's, that's another great skill to have, I think. And I, I know like spontaneity is so vital with improv, right? So, sure, um, yes. you know, like, is that something that you're drawn to? I mean, you just gravitate toward that kind of thing. It's like, okay, here's, I got to do something. Boom, go for it. It is. And there's, I tell you, there's nothing more exhilarating than when, if you can get to that place where you're completely trusting um, with with whoever your scene partners are, and there's a sometimes a bit of magic that can come out that nobody anticipated, and there's nothing more um, exhilarating than that. You know, if, when you have scripted material, you you know the words that are coming, but you can hit these moments, and we would do it on particularly in Quick Draw. You know, with this guy John Lear, who I've worked with a lot, and a, and a scene had happened, and neither of us knew that what it was going to happen and it did and they filmed it and it was just glorious you know and there's there's no better feeling that's awesome or very few better feelings um let's talk some firsts so i know you know early 90s 92 time frame you land in hollywood right and so yep. you know the first i think your first like tv series may have been i'm going to guess renegade maybe Yes, that was it. And that was actually how I got into the union. That was my SAG card entrance was a, it was a Lorenzo Lamas show. And I, I still remember that my, I had one I line. Remember that. Gosh, it was I remember. my, it was my one, um, my one line was shut up hog back in your cell. And I still remember that. <laughs> Was Lorenzo Lamas Bobby Six Killer or something? There was a name. Yes. Yes. <laughs> wow, you're good. Yes. As you are absolutely right. And I remember being on set and being so starstruck because um, the guy who played Hog, when I said, Shut up, Hog, get back in your cell, was um, um, blanking on the actor's name. He was the extremely large bearded guy who was in Revenge of the Nerds. Do you remember him? He played. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, I don't think his character name was Animal, but he was the brutish one. He was the beer drinker had a, and he was a big bro. And so he played this biker named Hog, but he was, I recognized him from, from these movies, from Revenge of the Nerds. And I was so excited to just see like, a, that was my first real sort of celebrity sighting. I was working with him and I was, uh, I was just sort of mouth agape. It was. So, you know, three years later, you get your first IMDb credit um, in terms of like a TV movie, right? You got the indictment McMartin trial. Um, <clears throat> so what I'd like to know about that is at that point in your life, 1995, take me back. What what do you remember? Something inside or outside of that? Um, well, uh, 
we're, we're probably staying away from politics, but I will tell you that I do remember <laughs> that because I punched James Woods. <laughs> the James punch. Woods? I, I, I stage punched the James Woods. That's hilarious. <laughs> and, I, and again, I was terrified because this was James Woods, who, you know, I, I really um, thought was, I really liked him as an actor. Um, and I was so scared that I was going to make contact. I'm not a stunt person. I mean, I'd done some stage, combat, but I didn't. And so, and I was supposed to throw this, a real, a full swing at him and just miss, just miss his chin. So he could, you know, do the. Um, Is there uh, a clip on that somewhere? <laughs> I've not, I've not looked for it. I'm sure it is. I mean, it was, it was oh indi goodness. indictment to the McMartin trial and there's a, he plays a defense attorney for those, um, the people accused of child molestation. Exactly. Who became sort of national. Um, oh, with the, the daycare? Uh, with yes, daycare? correct. Okay. Okay. I remember that. And so he plays the defense attorney and he becomes sort of public enemy number one because he's standing up for these people. And so he's traveling through a court, leaving a courthouse going through the court chambers and all the reporters swarm on him and there's a big melee and I'm just a sound engineer and I, and I jump out of nowhere and I punch him. There's some enlightenment Here they very come. clearly in the whole area of child abuse. I just hope that it doesn't lead to hysteria and contagion. Please, the lights are hurting her eyes. She's got cataracts. Come on, what are you doing? Come on, she has cataracts. I didn't hear what's, she heard What's going on? Hey, hey move that. What, what are you doing, son of a bitch? I'm a soldier to defend that devil. <laughs> okay, so off script, this is improv. Okay, this is your improv test. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm going to uh, Zoom punch you, okay, from here. <laughs> okay, all right. All right, here it comes. <laughs> oh, well <Okay>. done. <laughs> <laughs> So 1996, okay, let's go back there. That's your first film credit, right? Um, and I think Ed Harris may have been in that one. Um, and uh, is we, it uh, Eye for an Eye? Does that sound uh, right? Yeah, well, I know Kiefer Sutherland was in it and um, and Sally Field. I had a scene with Sally Field. It was just, I was just- Oh, a, wow. Uh, just another, I mean, I have a long, as, as you've seen in my, my resume, I have a long list of sort of, Low life le landlords, security guards, <laughs> a, a, you know, basement apartment dwellers. That's sort of been my my um, bread and butter for twenty years. And in this case, I think I was I ran a flea bag motel, uh, and Sally Field was coming and needed a room key for somebody, and so I had a very quick little scene with her. Very often, you're not held to a certain. Um, time limit you know a lot of the very very attractive leading men and leading women um have a harder time as as age you know comes Absolutely. along whereas these character people can sometimes go for 30 or 40 years um playing those those really fun little ancillary roles and uh and you don't have some of the heavy lifting of exposition you come in you have your three lines and maybe a, a good laugh line and then you're out and you're done for the <laughs> done for the but bob you're perfect for a coen brothers film I, you know, I, I got to tell you, I've auditioned for them like five times. Oh, and really? It's gonna, it's gonna, uh, they're great. And I love their films and I can't yeah. wait to, and it's going to happen eventually, but it just hasn't happened yet. I can yeah. tell you a funny Joel and Ethan story if you want. So That would be awesome. Yes. <laughs> okay. So, so I, I've auditioned, I, like I said, about four or five times. And the last time I went in for them, I think was for True Grit. And again, it was a, a person who the guy in the in the cabin who gets shot. And I made a joke when I because I went into the room, the casting director was there and Joel and Ethan were both there. And I said, you know, I just want, I need to say this is the, the fourth time you've called me in for somebody who gets shot in the head. And I don't know <laughs> if I'm supposed to take that personally or not. And um, and uh, Joel said um, some I think it was Joel that said, yeah. And he immediately, he was so smart because they're both so smart. He said, yeah, you know, we had something a couple months ago uh, and Ethan suggested you for it, but you didn't get shot. And I said, no, it doesn't feel right. <laughs> so I, they're just eventually, like a, eventually, yeah. it's yeah, got to exactly. happen. Oh my goodness. It's got to happen. <laughs> oh <my goodness>. Right. <clears throat> so NBA, while we're on that, and I think like in 96, you may have been in a movie with Shaquille O'Neal. Oh, it, yeah. That was, yeah, that was an experience. Kazam. Uh, yeah. he's, a rap, he's a rapping genie. 
<laughs> as big as stars you can get, right? You there's there's some things you, you there's some things you it's just can't huge. wipe off your resume, no matter how. Hard <laughs> you yeah. Well, and um, again, the only again there was another uh, the, the the highlight for me of that was it was directed by um, Starsky, Paul Michael Glazer. Were you a big Starsky? Oh, and Hutch? oh yes, Starsky and Hutch yeah. fan. Yes, so uh -huh. Paul Michael Glazer Definitely. and I was a huge Starsky and Hutch fan. So oh, absolutely. Um, as terrible as the movie was, I was at least excited to be getting some direction from Starsky. Yeah, so, I, I always liked him. Yeah, I, I tried to make I tried to make um, lemonade out of a lemon. Shaquille was very, <laughs> he was very pleasant. He was very yeah, nice. <laughs> and I know, you know, your wheelhouse and your career has been based on the unusual and the offbeat. And, and um, you know, we'll talk about Scrubs and Dr. Zeltzer and Tom oh, Cougar Town. I want to talk about that. Slow Roger. My name is uh, Earl. Uh -huh. um, but tell me how you ended up in the world of the, if you want to say, <laughs> offbeat and unusual. How you know, it's happen? funny. Well, um, I, you know, I think you just, uh, when you start your career out, you obviously you'll, you'll do anything. And you, if you're, I think if you're sort of smart, you start to see where people are, are um, directing you, um, whether it's your agents or cat, what, what roles casting directors are calling you in for more than others, you know, because I came from the theater world where, and we're sort of taught to that you can play anything, you know, I can be, I can be 25, but I sure I can play, I can play Lear or I can play, um, you know, Hamlet or anything. You put me in any, any play and I'll play any role because I'm an actor. But I think when you get to the TV and film world, you realize that it's all about finding your specific niche, right? So, and it started to become apparent. I was playing a lot of these kind of, really quirky off center. And you know, that come, comes naturally to me given my, you know, my <laughs> look and my voice, et cetera. So it wasn't a huge surprise. What was sort of surprised is that I was also getting a lot of, um, uh, I don't know how to say, maybe less in, the less intelligent, the more, um, you know, very, very working class um, and perhaps not as educated roles, which was, pretty antith antithetical to kind of my background. You know, I had this <laughs> Ivy League <laughs> sort of, and um, upper middle class upbringing. So, but but you, I, I think if you're smart, you embrace that and you go, well, that's how I'm going to start marketing myself. And I would have headshots done that are much more, um, uh, you know, uh, rural and um, unshaven, et cetera. And then you just, you follow that path. And I think that's how, particularly the character people can end up sustaining careers as being a little s smarter about their marketing yeah. um, and getting, getting specific with it. I was reading, I, I had read the bassoon King, which is Rain Wilson's. Mm -hmm. um, good. Uh, but it was, it was very good. And he talks about how he found like, he found his niche that he's, he knew when he auditioned for the office that that it was, that was him. That, that was he, him. He was Dwight. And, yeah. and then, and he, from then on wanted to be the quirky weirdo, you know, so that's what he goes for. And, and, um, you know, it's funny because they've always said, it's always been when I was growing up, you know, the, the, um, the phrase was, Oh, well, you don't want to get typecast. And, but I, I found my experience has been exactly the opposite. I think the best thing that can happen to an actor is to be typecast and to find right. out, well, this is exactly what you, what, how people want to see you. This is what you do well. It doesn't mean that you have to be super narrow or that every role is the same. You still find the nuances in the, the script, et cetera. But, you're, but I think that as a, for building a career, finding your path is really an advantage. And, you know, I'm thinking like in 19, 1997 timeframe, right? You were in LA Confidential. Melanie and I watched that again like a couple weeks ago. Oh, yeah. And that, that movie holds up mm. so well. It's amazing the performances, you know, Russell Crowe, Guy Pierce, and um, Kevin Spacey and Kim Basinger, you know, you could go on. You're in that, you know, what was it like to be part of that looking back on it now? Uh, well, I knew from the script that this was thing was really going to be incredible because just you read it and you're like, this is, this is not like anything we've seen before. Um, both Russell Crowe and Guy Pierce, I think were relatively, certainly to American audiences were really unknown. Um, I wasn't familiar with them as actors. Um, the names were um, certainly Kim Basinger, I think was the biggest name, but also Kevin Spacey had quite a, a name for himself as well. But there was a certain, there's just a, a feeling unlike the feeling on the Kazam set that you, that, that there was real 
greatness that was being created. And you watch, watch these, some of these guys work, James Cromwell, and you just, and I would stand behind, way behind the video village where you could watch the scene or watch the monitors, you know, if you, if you weren't working. And there was just such uh, um, artistry to what they were doing. And it was kind of exciting to just know that you were playing a tiny little, just a little, you know, just, I want to get my part right. And it's going to be a little reporter, tiny, baby. Tiny, tiny little piece of the machine, yeah. but, you know, just to be a part of this amazing, um, you know, piece of cinema was, was pretty exciting. Come on, come on, it's Christmas. Help come on, Eric. Right? It's Christmas Eve. I've just got a few more questions for the kids. Hey, don't all have to be down here, guys. Go. got many many different things to, to put on the resume it's mm -hmm. not many people that go okay porn clerk cellmate scary tall mover and put that on the resume but Bob <laughs> and <Lennon> can do that <laughs> tell me about I, that i love i love having i love the character description that has a has an adjective in it you know and i love you know weird weird security guard has my name written all over it and i love it but you know like we were talking about before i you know sometimes it it, it, it it's the times that I've been much more of a pivotal character in in a, in a piece is really exciting because you're part of the whole through line and the narrative and stuff, and you go through a journey. But there is something so rewarding to me about having those little ones, those one scene, one and done things that we talked about, where you can come in and just nail it, and you can be as weird or as interesting as you as you can choose to be, uh, and just and hopefully kind of flesh out the rest of this. This movie to me that's extremely rewarding and I and I love it. I wouldn't change a thing. Do I think you find? Actually... I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Do you find that you, you do not have to audition as much? Do they go? Well, we want a Bob Clendenin. It's Let's happening. See if he's... It's yes. It's um. I mean, I still audition and um. You know, it's still very competitive. But I've had more and more. Um, they call them straight offers, where it's just uh, my agent will get an inquiry about if I'm available to just do a particular project. And that's, that's extremely um, rewarding. I don't always love auditioning because to, to me, it's still anxiety producing, mm -hmm. but, um, but it's also a good skill to have and it keeps you kind of fresh. So I wouldn't want to never be auditioning, but it is nice to have those little, those little um, nuggets thrown at you every once in a while to make you feel like, well, at least I did something right. One of the shows, and it's rare, I mean, sports is my wheelhouse, so it's rare that I know something Melanie doesn't know when it comes to film. But I used to watch, <laughs> I used to watch 10 Items or Less. Oh, no kidding. Okay. And Great. I'd Carl never was, seen it. So. Yeah, she had never seen it. And then Carl the Stock Boy, yes. the crush on Yolanda, right? Yes, very um, much so. And you mentioned John Lear, right? Plays yes. uh, Leslie. And I'd like you to just take me back to that because I think that. It, to me, I see a lot of superstore in that particular show. Mm. Maybe you guys got a lot, I think more improv, maybe. Yeah, I don't think they're, they're really far more scripted than, than we were. And um, and we were pretty cut, cutting edge. Uh, I don't even know if Curb Your Enthusiasm was on at that point. Um, but so John and, and Nancy, the other creator, developed the show and they would... Um, uh, it was on TBS and they would get, uh, you know, an order for 13 episodes and they'd have the episode ideas, but they would write no dialogue. And so they would just have like a two page synopsis of what's going to happen in this episode. And the way the filming worked, which was fascinating to me, is that if it was just me and Yolanda that were in the particular scene, we'd come down, we'd have no idea what was happening. Nancy would say, OK, this is what's happened just prior to this. And this, these are the following pieces of information I need you to get out during the course of the scene. Um, and maybe give us some loose structure about where we might be or what the activity was if we're reshelving or whatever. And so we'd start the scene and there'd be three cameras, three cameramen are uh, positioned around so they can't see each other, but they're, we get in three different angles on the actors. Um, and we just, we'd, we'd improv a scene and Nancy would cut and say, okay, this was really great. This was great in this middle. Can we do something like this? And then we try it again and we do it over the course of maybe two or three hours. Um, until eventually the scene really had some shape and, uh, and they've got a ton of material of coverage on it and they could, and they, the amount of footage that they'd have for one episode could sometimes be, you know, a hundred hours of, of footage for a 20 minute episode. So like it really was an editor's kind of nightmare, but, 
Um, it was such a fun way to work for actors um, because you, every 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 take was new, every take was fresh, and you could try something new. You could you could finesse something you did the last time, but just make it even better. Um, it was really it was it was a blast. And then we did the same format in Quick Draw, which was a improvised western on Hulu with a lot of the same people. With John and Nancy, was it was their second show. Um, some of the cast changed, but a lot of the a lot of them stayed the same. There were some very familiar faces that showed up again. And it's just, a, you know, it's a, it's a different way to work. Um, I think it's tough on, on the crew because they've got to really, they've got to be improvisers as well. Uh, they don't know what's going to happen. They don't know that I'm going to do whatever because I don't know I'm going to do it until it happens. And so they've got to be willing to roll with it. Um, and, but it can be really, it can be really exciting. And we shot it in a, in a live working supermarket in Reseda, really? California. Oh, wow. <clears throat> so they had notices on the entrance to the to the store that there is filming is happening in progress if you don't want to be part of the scene you know uh don't don't go near it um and if somebody did if a shopper you know ended up in a scene for whatever reason the crew would then go and get their permission to use it and make sure that they were okay with it but there were shoppers coming and going as we were uh, we, I, occasionally when I was waiting to, to, to do a scene, I'd get asked where the mayonnaise was, you know, by somebody. <laughs> um, uh, uh, and at first I would say, well, I don't work here, but by the second or third season, I'd say, well, it's aisle five. On the left. <laughs> hey, Carl. How you doing? Hi, Leslie. Oh, hey, Manny. Hey. How you doing? Good. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. Where's your mom? Um, she's at my house. <clears throat> Nanny was putting stuff on the MySpace page from Yolanda's Dream Journal. She was really mad. She was screaming. Ooh. She was just, oh, I can't I don't know, but she was pretty mad. Oh, man. So I was going to talk to her about, you know, some dance moves, you know. Oh. Maybe she could. Well, I dance. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I pop it every once in a while, so. All right. Well, yeah, I wouldn't mind learning a couple of pops. Sure. I bought some music here that the kids are listening to. Now, one thing to remember is you got to let the music sort of enter your body. What do you mean? Listen to the beat, and you'll feel it start to kind of oh, hit. Figuratively. The... That's what freestyling is all about. Let the groove just find my spine. It's all going to be very natural, very organic. OK. Why don't you jerk that? <clears throat> all right, let's give it a pop. Here we go. The, um, the difference between being like a series, like that was a series, what they call a series regular in this or in quick draw. And so you know that you're hired for either all the episodes or maybe 10 of the 13 episodes or whatever, but your employment feels a lot more secure than it does when you're <laughs> um, a guest star, you know? So like when I go on a show, like um, even the first episode of uh, Cougar Town, which was just supposed to be one episode or Scrubs or my name is earlier that you feel um, a, like a visitor and you also feel like if I mess this up, um, A, I could be fired or, but I'm, certainly there's not going to be any repeat. So you feel a lot and you don't know the crew, you don't know their names. Um, you're not as familiar with the other actors. It's a lot more um, nerve wracking because you don't have that familiarity or that, that um, comfort that comes with just being sort of part of the team. Um, so other than that, you know, there's not a, a whole lot of difference in terms of how the actor works, I don't think. But um, but yeah, it's just it's just a little bit more. You feel a little more comfortable when when you know that you can't be fired. And and so Scrubs, right? So mm -hmm. let's talk about that because you were a recurring character on Scrubs, Doctor yes. Seltzer, and tell me about that. What was it like being on that show? Well, it was it was never you know with I was lucky in in with many of those shows that none of them were sort of. Um, uh, designed as recurring characters, but they become them. Um, and so like, and Scrubs was another one. That was the very first time I've worked with Bill Lawrence, who's the creator and, uh, and showrunner of, of Scrubs and Cougar Town. And he's just a remarkable guy. And I love the guy to death. And that was, a, I did one episode and you just really liked 
this character. And so, you know, they had this, I was this weird oncologist who was kind of a sexual deviant. You just say these really offhanded things that people, you know, like, like a comment that just came out of nowhere. And people were like, what was that? It's just really odd. And it was perfect for me. Like, I think in terms of like ease of um, comfort with a character, the Dr. Zeltzer was probably my, the limit, like it just to, because I love those, just the, oh. the, those comments that just come out of nowhere. And people are like, did he mean that that way? Or did that, <laughs> what? And then you just wander off. Um, but that was, so that was my introduction to Bill Lawrence and Dr. Zeltzer, uh, the first episode. And then, you know, a couple episodes, four or five weeks later, we, my agent gets a call and says, we'd like to bring Dr. Zeltzer back for another <laughs> thing. And so I think in the, in total, I probably only was in, eight or 10 episodes of the show over the course of whatever, six, seven seasons. Um, but it was always just like, I know every scene I had was just great. It had a, some killer, you know, um, tagline. Yeah, exactly. Like uh, doing the dishes. Say, <laughs> so, uh, Zeltzer, my family is with me here today, but all the tables are full. Do you mind if we join you for breakfast? Oh, not at all. I get family. I'm here so much, I hardly ever see my wife. That's why I installed a web camera at my house so I can see her during the day. Right now I'm watching her do the dishes. Who in God's name are those two naked people? That's uh, a Mr. and Mrs. Dish. Get out! <laughs> yeah, that's my wife doing the dishes. That was a classic one. There was one where um, uh, my, my all-time favorite, I think, was when the, uh, all the doctors were standing in front of the, one of those x-ray monitors looking at the x-ray of a, somebody who had a light bulb um, stuck up where it absolutely should not be. And so, and we're, we're all standing there as a moment of silence as we, as we, as we're studying this x-ray. And then Dr. Zeltzer says, that's why my wife and I use candles. <laughs> and, it, and it comes out of nowhere. <laughs> that's my favorite thing. <clears throat> um, so yeah, so that was, and that was my first um, uh, wor working with Bill Lawrence who, you know, he's one of these guys who I think he really likes to have a sort of a stable of people that he likes working with. Um, and his sets are always just so low key and easy and manageable and friendly and fun. Um, and that's because he has this. And, you know, like uh, another person I admire who I have not worked with, is like Christopher Guest, somebody like that. You know, Oh, like yeah. All, all his Spinal people. Tap. Yeah, exactly. Spinal Tap and, and um, Best in Show. And Best in Show. Yeah. Guffman, all those, they're all just classics and they're all the same people he loves to work with. He mm -hmm. knows how they work. They improvise heavily um, and they're just great people and they, and they great, do great, um, great stuff. Judd Apatow is another guy like that. Mm -hmm. you know, you see a lot of the same faces up here for the same reason. So I love working with Bill and that, and that was, I was so fortunate to get that, um, that introduction to him through that show. And watching, watching the Bill Lawrence sitcoms and all of that and Scrubs and Cooper Talent and it, it always made not only you guys on the staff making the, the art, it also made the audience feel like they were in on the family. Like I'm in on yeah. this. This is the way I talk at my house. Yeah. They, he, you know, he's bringing that to, it's like, yeah. oh, wow. I yeah. didn't know. It, feels, it feels very, very familiar. Very familiar, very comfortable. And I think that's <clears> probably <throat> why he's so successful. I yeah. have a question regarding Scrubs. Yes. Have you listened to the fake doctor's Real Friends podcast at all? I has I have I, I got uh, I, I get alerted when um, when uh, Zach uh, mentions me. Some of my friends who listen to it all the time say he talked to you about you today. You should listen. <laughs> I, I I I faithfully listened to it when when they first started it. Yeah. And then I kind of got away from it this this uh, November December because the holidays and I haven't been back. So I thought sure. I wonder if Bob Clinton ever went on there. I have not yet. I'm still waiting for Zach's call. He's got a Are lot you of people kidding to, me. He's got he's got a lot now. In, in fairness, a lot of people to go through to I'm before like he gets to me. But, but I'm quite happy because when he when my name does come up, he's extremely flattering. Oh yes, and, he is. He and is. so I so I'm delighted that he uh, that he remembers my name. And whatever happened to Beard to say? <laughs> 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 you know he's also Zach's also I've worked with him you know he's directed twice he did uh Garden State and then I did this I did his last movie um Wish uh, I Were Here Wish, Wish I Were Here mm -hmm. uh and I think the, I think very highly of him as well he's just a super nice guy and so you he's can adorable. tell and I think unbelievably talented yeah absolutely yeah. what about Scrubs I mean excuse me what about um 
Cougar Town. I know that you were a recurring character on there, Tom, right? And, right. <clears throat> and, um, you know, you, you know, Courtney Cox and others. So what's it like being a part of that family? So that was um, another one where I was just coming in for one episode um, as sort of the, the weird neighbor who has a crush on her. And this was um, the one of the things that they'll like Bill will talk about is that their biggest mistake was the title of that show. And it just killed them oh. that nobody nobody wanted to see a show about cougars or very few people. It just didn't reach a broad audience. And what it was, it was much more like they 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 were trying to advertise it or move it in the direction of being like older friends with wine. Um, right. Yeah. Which is what it was. It was this really tight knit group of of forty somethings um, who drink a lot of wine and and do funny stuff. And there's very little about that that whole cougar hunting young right. men thing. That was just a sort of a, and unfortunately it was saddled in the title, so it was really hard to get away from. But so what happened was they had a character named Barb who was a true cougar. She's a very very funny actress. Um, but when they were trying to move away from this whole cougar thing was about the time they kind of Barb was sort of that, that she was the recurring character plus the group and they were moving away from her. And I happened to come in at the right time as the weird neighbor. So <laughs> as Barb exited, I sort of came in and they started writing more stuff <clears throat> from, for that involved Tom or, you know, Tom could be ancillary in some of those. Um, so one episode turned into, I think, 60 or something i sort of became a semi-regular at the end um but couldn't have been a nicer group of people again such an easy show to do uh by the time i arrived you know, when it was really six seasons later it was really working like clockwork um courtney's a, a just a dream uh unbelievably sweet and generous and and lovely person so it was a great place to go to work i loved it and to feel like you were getting paid for that was sort of kind of embarrassing here you go. Ugh. I haven't really dug a hole before. Wait, what the hell is this? That is your first blister. Oh, I have not lived a hard life. You're welcome. <laughs> hey, Mom, you and Dad got married young. Do you regret it? <laughs> yes. Thank you for asking. I mean, that was the worst thing ever. It's like throwing all of your dreams into a dumpster and then just pooping on them. <laughs> But then again, because of that marriage, we got you. <laughs> so I guess on the topic of getting married young, I'm like an idiot, I have no real strong feelings either way, you know? I got married at 16 to the love of my life. Best thing I ever did. Hmm. Hey, Trav, did you happen to find any of Tom's business in those holes? Let me check. No. Nope. Sorry, Tom. None of your business over here. <laughs> Don't you love her fire? I guess. I brought some stuff for you to bury. Yeah, that's not really what I'm doing, dude. I want to say you're the founding member, maybe, of the Circle X Theater Company. I was, yes. I was one of the six founders, you're correct. You're on the board, I'm thinking, yep. and you've so, acted in a couple of things, correct. probably. Um, yep. Tell me about that. Tell me a little bit about that. So back in the 90s, there were a bunch of us, and we sort of uh, knew each other through graduate school and different relationship, different uh, Utah Shakespeare Festival, we, a couple of us knew each other from. So there were about six of us. And we were getting a little disillusioned with um, Los Angeles theater because we all came from a really hard theater background. We wanted to do good plays. And, mm -hmm. and Los Angeles theater was really much more about kind of a stepping stone to TV. So it was really not very, not, not great plays. It was much more look at me and showcase and stuff like that. And we said, we want to do plays like we did in grad school. So the six of us started this theater company called Circle X. Um, and uh, do, do you want to hear the reason why it's called Circle X? <clears throat> it's, I think it's a fascinating story. <laughs> <laughs> Two of our members went to um, the museum at Ellis Island and they were walking around looking at the displays. And it turns out that when immigrants came from, from Europe to Ellis Island and they were being assessed, if you got um, an X chalked on your lapel, it means you had a, um, a, a potentially communicable disease, perhaps tuberculosis okay. or the flu or something like that, um, but something that they should be aware of. Oh, if okay. you had an X with a circle around it, it meant you were mentally unstable and probably should go home. <laughs> <laughs> and when that's they awful. saw this, when they saw this, they said, that's us. We're Circle X. We, yes. are the outcast, we are the outcasts that are potentially harmful or, you know, or, or just not quite right for society. 
and it just you know, stuck. And we thought that was a, a beautiful purple, and it was a, and it's a great a little um, logo with the X with the circle around it. So I love the fact that you're still doing theater like that too. Yeah, I mean, that's and, so, cool. and I love and I just love it. I love theater people. I love the process of doing shows. I mean, it's a big time commitment. I've got a family, so it's I'm not as able to spend as much time as I like to. But you know, I like I mentioned earlier, I'm a carpenter, so I love when we do set builds and. <clears throat> Uh, taking down sets. I also like acting. Um, Are you I'm a pool a, shark, Bob? I am. A, I'm, I'm. I don't know if I'd still call myself one, but I certainly was one in college. Yes. <laughs> so you would hustle in college. Now I I say no because I to me hustling is when you pretend that you're worse than you are at some point. <laughs> I think you know how like a hustler would like oh I lost again let's play it for a hundred dollars that guy's a mm -hmm. hustler. I always played my best game. If somebody else wanted to play and do it for ten or twenty dollars, we would do it. And I ended up making a, a couple summers, um, uh, funding a couple summers that way. So, but it was no, there was no. I never was in the in afraid of getting beat up in the alley, uh, the way you know, color of money was. Never play pool with a math and science guy from Cornell. It's true. <laughs> it doesn't and, work out well. <laughs> or musicians are very good as well because I think they they tend to have the same very linear minds. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so, so back up a minute. You said you did you do uh, set design. You help with the set designs or not, uh, not design, just builds. I'm a carpenter. I love okay. carpentry. Yep. Yeah. So I do. <clears throat> I'm pretty good at making platforms and different scenery. I um, I learned how to weld not too long ago because of, uh, my brother gave me a gift. So I made a uh, a bar out in our backyard and nice. some furniture and stuff like that. So it's I'm trying to keep. Um, sort of semi-productive in all the downtime we have, particularly with COVID, you know, doing different yeah. projects, making stuff. You know, tell me what it's like to be, um, to hustle, if you will, for <laughs> those roles, because I'm sure there's rejection involved um, everywhere you go, right? It's so competitive. <clears throat> it's so competitive. And, um, you know, I've, I've likened it to being a professional job interviewer, mm -hmm. or interviewee, like you'd like, it's, if, if things are going well, you're getting rejected three or four times a week for something, yeah. <laughs> which yeah. is kind of a weird, terrible, that makes sense. Um, you know, but, uh, and one of the tough hurdles at first is not taking it personally. You know, there's so many, um, so many reasons that you cannot get a job. I mean, there, you could be bad, yeah. but more, more often than not, it's because you were, you were too tall or too young, or you reminded the producer of his brother-in-law who he doesn't like or you know there's really <laughs> yeah. any number of reasons you didn't get it and so once you I think once the vets who have been in it for a while um you know you you go into the audition room and you you do it and then you leave and it's up and it's in somebody else's hands and you just walk away and go into the next one you don't dwell on it you don't agonize over what you wished yeah. you'd done or or what you know um I hope they liked me you know you just you you try and do a good job and then move on to the next. And I think once the, the mental aspect of this um, profession is probably the hardest for some people to, to get a hold of. And you, uh, you've, uh, you've done commercials as well, which we haven't touched on. And, and that's, yeah. I mean, that, that's overlooked and underrated too, in my opinion. It's a whole I mean, other world too. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's so funny when I first started out back in the nineties, there was a real hierarchy that, you know, film actors didn't really do TV and TV actors didn't do commercials. Um, and it was sort of this little strata. But now, I mean, for the last 15, 20 years, it's been much more everybody. Yeah, Meryl Streep's yeah. doing a Netflix series. Uh, you know, Brad Pitt's doing um, car commercials in Europe. It's, you know, it's all um, all melded. And I think the actors who are going to have long careers have, um, you know, a little uh, are working in every different genre and field that they can. They can. It's a whole pastiche. Yeah, you, I think you you may have been in an Apple commercial. I mean, um, mm. if I get that wrong, I apologize. But a really no, it, it well was, done yeah. Apple commercial. Yeah, boy, it was and it you, was gorgeous too. The, they, yeah. and, I mean, they've got a lot of money to throw around, so they had a cinematographer who was just I don't know if you've seen it. Uh, the, I yeah. put all my commercials on my website, and um, I don't think I've seen that. <laughs> It's it beautiful. I mean, yeah. it is a work of art. The, the the cinematography on this commercial is just stunning. <laughs> settle, settle, please. Eyes up here. Eyes up here. We're not done. Group three. Let's have Ivy and Michael, uh, Ryan, Sally, and Thomas. Thomas, your homework is to explore gravity. Okay, um, don't forget, projects are due on Friday. Friday, please. 
Friday, and don't forget your homework. Uh, I also did one. There's another one that you might want to look at on my website, which was for um, a, a European. It never, never aired in this country. It was a European um, finance uh, investment firm called Orange, and so we got to set and we're filming out in the Mojave Desert. It's a really neat, neat idea, and um, we're filming out in the Mojave Desert. And I'm watching. I'm sort of getting, you know, as an actor, I was just trying to kind of watch the crew, how they're behaving, and what's happening. I've noticed that that instead of the director being really um, the, the main person everybody's looking to, everybody's looking to this, this one guy who's very striking looking, who is the, the director of photography, the cinematographer. And it's Bob, Bob Richardson, who if you look at him, look him up, he's won like five Academy Awards really? for cinematography. He did Snow Falling on Cedars. He's, I mean, he's, his work is gorgeous. And this company, this European finance company, had enough money to throw to get Bob wow. Richardson to shoot their wow. commercial. But you see it, like if you if you watch this commercial, you could freeze frame almost anywhere and it's and it's it's a frameable piece of art. It's like wow. the 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 color, the the composition. It's I mean it's stunning. And so like a lot of these commercials, and Apple's another one. They've got the money yeah. to to do it. And it's a it's a half a half a 30 second or a 45 second um film. And they and, and wow. it'll take sometimes two or three days to film a 45 second commercial. It's yeah. remarkable. Is there anybody, I'm sure you have a list, if you had to name a list. Yes. Who would be your top five that you've never worked with that you want to work with? In any uh, capacity, it could be another actor, it could be well, a director. It we could talked be about, and you can scratch us off the list. It's five other okay. people. A so writer. Five other, five other <laughs> besides today. Um, the Coen brothers would still be on there. Um, I would say uh, it, just to do some work with the, that Christopher Guest group would be amazing. Um, in terms of people, right I think so. I mean, I love. I also love that whole Judd Apatow group. Um, mm -hmm. Whether it's um, um, uh, James Franco and uh, Seth Jonah, Rogen. Jonah Hill, Seth Rogen, yeah. um, Michael. Uh, um, oh God, he was in. Um, uh, Arrested Development, um, Michael Sarah. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you saw that one where the it's the end of the world one. The um, it's the most yes. bizarre movie ever. And yep, but this is the end, end, right? This, this is, is the, the end. end. Oh, oh yeah, it was awesome. Yeah. Uh, I thought that was just genius. Um, I, the shows that I really regret not being on were my two favorite shows of all time were Arrested Development and um, the Larry Sanders show. Larry yeah. Sanders. Oh, show was, oh, both oh. of them, excellent. Um, it's a little bit before my time. I, I was just arriving in Los Angeles, but I just think that was such a brilliant. A brilliant yeah. show about the industry, you know, and on just heart rending that and the ending of that series when they're all just sharks and horrible people is just um, yeah. Uh, yeah. just devastating. Yeah. So um, yeah, that would be my list. Did you say who? What was the other one? Oh, oh Arrested uh, Development. Arrested oh, and, and, and Arrested Development, which I think was just is just a genius a genius show. I love the sense yeah. of humor that the way yeah. they would have, they would start a plot line and then within 20 minutes, we, we'd go through this ridiculous roundabout and then come back to where we started was just yeah. phenomenal. Oh, and I think Jason Bateman, I just, now I'm oh, you know, so yeah. in love with Ozark yeah. and oh, yeah. everything he's doing. He's just, uh, he's a, a, a treasure as far as I'm concerned. And, and Bob, like for everybody that's out there um, watching, where can we find you? What's your website, your Twitter, um, all that, social media? For career, for career, um, probably my website is my best. My best. It's got everything I've ever done on it. Says, and it's www.robertclendenin.com. R O B E R T C L E N D E N I N dot com. Um, I'm a pretty obnoxious politically on Twitter and I keep it there and I don't let it bleed into the rest of my life, but I'm at Bob Clendenin on Twitter. Um, and that's, those are my two real ven my two real venues. Okay. And I have one last question and you've probably been asked this before, but if you had one piece of advice for other aspiring actors, what would that be? Oh, wow. Um, uh, I think it would be it would it would be what we alluded to earlier, which is don't let the the mental game get you down. If you really love what you're doing, and you and you pursue it, there's especially now more than ever, there are so many avenues for you to create your own content. You may it may it may be ten years before you actually get somebody else to pay you for 
what you're doing. But in terms of the rewards, if you you can shoot stuff on your iPhone, if you and your friends have a great idea for a 30 second bit that's funny, you can now shoot it and and edit it and ha even have a platform to put it up, um, whether it's TikTok or YouTube or whatever. Mm -hmm. You can get eyeballs on it, um, and you can do what you love. And I uh, and I think now more than ever. So uh, and and then that can lead to to so many things. I think if um, yeah, if you love what you do, uh, stick with it. And we love you, Bob Clinton, and thank you. For uh, this doing was it. this was delightful, Michael, Melanie. It was just such thank a joy you. to talk to you guys. I, I can't believe how well um, researched you were, and I really <laughs> appreciate that. That was that made this really really fun. Thank you. I've enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Here we go.